let me just once again say exam is 430 to 6, social science 122, uh, open everything, no messaging, bring, definitely bring a calculator and all slides from all the classes and such things. So today we're going to try to apply the principles we've been learning about monopoly theory to what I think is a pretty important social problem, certainly one that's been in the news a lot recently, which is the inequality um, which has been growing in the United States, inequality of income and wealth, which has been growing in the United States and around the world in recent years. Um, and I'll talk about why, even if you're a libertarian who's naturally skeptical of government intervention, you may be sympathetic to redistributing wealth because it provides effectively insurance against risks that you would have faced before <coughs> you knew who you are right now. So if you, you know, keep rolling back time and you think about uh, the decisions you would have made about insurance, that might lead you to want to redistribute wealth. <coughs> redistribution uh, under this perspective is going to aim to maximize the average utility of people in society and because of the concavity of utility in income this is going to mean that the poor place a greater marginal value on a dollar and we'll use this as a framework for analyzing optimal taxation both thinking about sort of the optimal linear tax rate which is sort of the average tax rate that an ordinary American should pay as well as um, a special tax surcharge for people earning, say, above a million dollars, which is something that the Obama administration has been proposing recently. We'll then um, calibrate this model on um, data on the income distribution and elasticities of labor supply, which will be two crucial inputs. And we'll talk about some of the issues related to this type of analysis, which the basic principles we'll talk about are going to ignore. <coughs> yes, there you go. Um, is the surcharge? Uh, rate. <coughs> yeah, it's a progressive rate. So it's like, it's what I mean by surcharge is a rate that you charge on people who are above. But uh, it's even progressive, like just for them, not just compared to the. No, no, no. It's just a, it's just a flat rate for them. Oh, there's a flat. Rate. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, for any income earned above a million dollars, you'll pay a rate that's above or potentially below. You could actually have them pay a lower tax rate, but we'll calculate what, which one's optimal. And then. I'll talk about um, some other applications of the theory of optimal redistribution. Okay, so there are basically three different types of inequalities in income. So inequality means <coughs> that different people are in different incomes. And basically, income inequality can be decomposed into three forms. One is called is poverty, <coughs> which is um, typically measured by the nut fraction of people who are below a po poverty line. Uh, the U.S. poverty line is way, 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 way above the global poverty line. So the global poverty line is like a dollar a day. The U.S. poverty line is something like $15,000 a year or something like that for a family of four. So um, clearly it's way higher. A better way to think about poverty rather than being some absolute line is sort of um, the number of people who are below some fraction of the median income. Right? And the interesting thing is that poverty has not really been growing significantly in recent years. So lots of other forms of inequality have been growing, and I'll talk about that, but poverty really has not gotten uh, worse. It got slightly worse during the 1980s, it got better during the 1990s, and it stayed flat during the 2000s. The second is what you could call sort of mid-range inequality. It's like how different are people in the lower middle class, you know, compared to people in the upper middle class, or something like that. And this is typically measured by the Gini coefficient, uh, which measures how far a distribution of wealth is from perfect equality. And I'll show you a graph in a second that, that will explain exactly how you measure that. And this has grown somewhat over time, but not very much. So Gini coefficient inequality in the United States in the last, since like say the early 80s has increased somewhat, but not a lot. Um, top income shares are a final type of inequality. And this measures inequality at the very top. It says, you know, what fraction of all national wealth is taken by the top 10%, the top 1%, the top 0.1%, and so forth. And this measures the concentration of wealth at the very top. And this is the thing that when people talk about inequality growing has been just absolutely exploded. So poverty has not been growing very much. Inequality overall has been growing a little bit, but there are a few people who are just making an enormous amount of money compared to everybody else. 
Okay, so how do we measure the Gini coefficient? So this is a graph of it. Um, there's this thing called the Lorenz curve. And what this says is, imagine we take the, like, uh, people who are at the 40th percentile of the income distribution. And we ask, how much of total national wealth does that group of people own? And that's going to be the point on the Lorenz curve here. Right? So if the bottom 40% controlled 5% of wealth, then 40% would correspond to 5% on this graph. If they controlled 40% of wealth, it would be on the 45 degree line. Right? So if we had a perfectly equal society, we would just have this 45 degree line, and that would be the Lorenz curve. Right? But if we start getting more and more unequal, you see that the <coughs> bottom many percent will control very little, and then it'll skyrocket as you get towards the top part of the distribution. And so Gini coefficient is just the area between the line of equality and the Lorenz curve over the sum of the two areas. The sum of the two areas is just one half, so it's just two times the area. Uh, between the line of equality and the Lorentz curve. So two times A? Two times A. Or A over uh, A plus B. Um, okay, so uh, inequality in the upper part of the income distribution has been skyrocketing in the United States. So, and in fact, the wealth, the incomes of most people in the country have hardly been growing. Almost all of the income growth in the United States has come from people at the absolute top. So to get a sense for that, here's 1913. Um, if you look during the um, 20s, you know, during the stock market boom, the amount taken by the top people absolutely skyrocketed. Then during the Depression, it came way down. And as we had the New Deal and, all, and World War II and all these reforms, the, the share taken by the top absolutely plummeted. Right? It got down to about 10%. Then, starting in the late 70s, and particularly in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, the, the share of income taken by the top 1% has absolutely skyrocketed. And it's now basically up at the historical peak, which was at the height of the... Uh, the height of the... Um, stock market boom in the 1920s. Um, on the other hand, people who are in 5 to 10 percent, their share has increased somewhat, but not nearly to the levels it was. And people who are in 10 to 5 percent, top 5 percent, it's hardly changed. So it's only at the very, very top of the income distribution that inequality has gotten greater. Yeah? Um, is, that, is, that, like, is that adjusted for inflation? Yeah. So are the, the, the purchasing powers of, of the people in the top You're saying, you are thinking about the things that are bought by the top people versus the rest of the population? I mean, you say, like, is the 1% just able to buy more things? <coughs> like, obviously the 1% yeah. is able to, but the rest, the 99% like, yeah. are they able to buy less things than they were able to? Or no, they're still their, their, income, the same level? their real income has basically stayed flat. And these are the share of national income that's taken by these people and it's just skyrocketed. Yeah, David. How like in the nineteen and early nineteen seventies you have the top one percent falling below the yep. brackets, but if it's the top one percent, how is that possible? Because this is the total fraction of income taken by the top one percent versus the top five to, to one percent. But in, in, in the early seventies aren't they no longer the top one percent if they're below the other group? No, but this is the total amount of national income taken by them. Okay. Oh, okay. And these are these people can account for four percentage points. Gotcha. And this guy is only one. So if they're equal, that would mean that these guys make five times as much on average as these, or sorry, four times as much on average as these right. guys do. Okay. And now they're making eight times as much on average as the, the other guys do. Okay. So the top 1%, by the way, is in 2008, people earning over $370,000 a year. Um, okay. So many libertarians would say to this, I don't know if anyone here is sort of a libertarian or a very conservative Republican, would say, so what? You know, the, the people who are up there, they earned it. Uh, you know, that's, that's just how things pan out. Um, and John Harsanyi and John Rawls uh, gave what I think is probably the most compelling argument against taking that perspective on inequality. Um, and 
uh, their idea was to try to use a very libertarian <coughs> choice-based approach to argue for redistribution. And is Edward here? No. Does anyone else uh, want to try to summarize Harsanyi's argument? Yeah, David. I think that um, when individuals don't know uh, where they're going to end up in society, yeah. um, it makes sense to try to either look at the average or the kind of minimum um, utility level of the individuals in society mm -hmm. and try to maximize that uh, in order to provide some like safety against ending up in a really terrible condition. Yeah, that's right. So I think you know one very parsimonious way to summarize their argument is a quote from a famous preacher from the 16th century who, when he saw a bunch of poor people walking through the streets, said, there but for the grace of God go I. Right? So the idea was that he could imagine that if he hadn't been lucky, he might have ended up as those people. And therefore, he would like to try to make society so as if he didn't know who he would end up being, uh, he would be happy to live in that society. Right? And this is really just the same thing that people uh, think about when they think about buying insurance. right? You know, if I'm afraid of getting sick, I buy insurance to protect me against the possibility of being made destitute by my medical bills. Or if I'm afraid of my house burning down, I buy insurance to make sure that I'm not destitute because my house burns down, right? Uh, auto insurance is similar, medical insurance. Um, and the basic idea is that money is worth more to you when you're poor than when you're rich, so you're willing to pay an insurance premium to make sure that if something really bad happens to you, you are protected against that, right? Um, and so it seems natural that if you're willing to buy insurance on these things, you would want to buy insurance on something that's even more important. Like, you know, are you born into a poor or rich family? Are you born in the United States or in a, you know, the Congo? Are you, uh, you know, born uh, healthy or are you born sick, right? And, um, the truth is people can't buy insurance against that because, you know, first of all, some of these things you're just born with. So by the time you're born, there's no way you can buy insurance against them. But also because, um, you know, even things that happen early on in your life, um, you're going to be way too young and not have any money and not really even have the legal right to buy insurance when you're really young. So something that happened to you during your childhood, which really affects your, the rest of your lifetime well-being, uh, isn't something that you can buy insurance against. Right? So the argument is that the government should therefore sort of act as an insurance agent for you. Given that almost everyone buys insurance against major life events when they have the chance to do that, it makes sense that basically Given that you're not able to buy insurance for yourself, the government should effectively be buying insur selling insurance to people. That is, it should be um, redistributing wealth from the wealthy to the poor just because people would have chosen that uh, if they had had the choice to you know, make that uh, before they were born. Um, and therefore, policy should seek to maximize the expected utility that people earn. Because people, if they put themselves in the position before they were born, don't know who they're going to be, right? And so they're just as likely to be anyone in society. And so if we maximize the average well-being of people in society, then uh, that will maximize the utility that every person gets before they know who they are. Um, and, and this is basically the Harsanyi-Rawls argument for redistribution. Um, so if we buy into that, then we think that we should maximize the average utility that people get. Right? And this principle is called utilitarianism. It originates with Jeremy Bentham's work, where he said that we should try to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Uh, and the way we usually think about doing this in practice is we think of Everyone's utility is depending on their income and then on a bunch